Hi everyone, I'm Kate Milliken. I'm the founder of My Counterpain and I have been living with MS since 2006 and this is My Counterpain 101. Today we'll be discussing stem cells and new treatments in the realm of progressive MS. And with me to do that is Dr. Saad Sadiq, the Director and Chief Research Scientist at the Tisch MS Research Center of New York. Dr. Sadiq works as a full-time MS specialist for people living with MS, and he's a researcher who's looking at the mechanisms of MS progression, biomarker development, and stem cell biology in clinical use. Dr. Sadiq, I was super interested in speaking with you, A, because I know a number of your patients who love you, um, but also because you are involved in work with stem cells. And in the world of MS, stem cells has been such a hot topic, and particularly HSCT, um, which uh, over time, you know, and through research and understanding what HSCT is, um, we know is for actively relapsing MS. It's a very small population. And one of the things I was most curious about your work with stem cells is the fact that it's in the, in the realm of progressive. So my question for you is, why don't we start with you giving us an explanation of what you're trying to do with stem cells. All right. If I may, I would just like to correct one thing that, you, not correct, but put it in a different way. All the treatments that are available currently, uh, the FDA approved treatments and the off label FDA approved treatments, so for the treatment of the disease, including HSCT. HSCT is not a a uh, stem cell treatment in that it's not for repair. HSCT is a sort of slightly misused term in that they give a very powerful immune suppression and then they reboot your immune system. So if you look at treatments that are currently available for MS, for example, doing nothing and doing naturopathic treatments, to using beta interferons, Copaxone, and then the oral medications, Tecfidera and so on. And then Natalizumab and Rituximab and Ocrelizumab and Daclizumab and so many treatments that are coming out. I would say the end of that road, Alimatuzumab, I should have, and some other drugs. The, 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 the most, if I would say, uh, uh, effective treatment, if you want to call it, but also very, in some ways, toxic, is HSCT. So that's a spectrum of treatments. Just like with uh, diabetes, you take, the, you take exercise and weight loss, and then maybe a pill, and then maybe insulin, and then maybe a continuous insulin device that's implanted in your body for severe cases. So it's really dealing with the immune system. So HSCT is at the one end of the spectrum of immunotherapies. And, and, and a very drastic one. And it's the most drastic one, and it reboots your immune system. And the stem cell component of HSCT refers to reloading cells that would re repopulate your immune cells, hopefully with the more normal cells that do not react against you. So it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. And it, this is a whole, so up to the time that we got involved, uh, there were treatments for the disease, but once you developed disability and you had deficits or you became progressive and you then said, I want to stop using my cane. I want to stop using my walker. I want to get out of the wheelchair. I want to be able to use my hands. There was really no treatment for that. So our approach for the last 15 years was try to develop treatments that would induce repair and would hopefully be able to do that. And as we looked into that field, we went through a number of growth factors and options early on in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And then we settled on using uh, this population of cells that are found in the bone marrow. They're also found in adipose tissue, but we use the bone marrow cells to try to uh, use them as a source of repair. Um, so, in light of where you are, um, uh, what has been the results in terms of the work you've done with the progressive patients? All what right. have you seen that has excited you? All right. So, what we did was, of course, when you do something like that, you, uh, and just so we really understand this, patients who get stem cell treatment, at least at our center, they continue their disease treatment because they are two different, they're parallel courses. 
So, you know, you would, if you're on uh, natalizumab or tesabri, you continue that while you get the stem, because this is meant to repair. It's not supposed to treat the disease. So we use, we first sort of showed that these stem cells from bone marrow could be used. We make them into brain stem cells. So we established the basis for that experimentally. Then we studied them in animals and showed that giving it to a mouse model of MS uh, injected into the spinal fluid of a mouse, it would actually repair the, the experimental MS. And then we did a pilot study in, in very few sort of six patients uh, over time to study their safety and figure out a dose that we wanted to use. And with that, is that a, um, a technically a phase one? Where no, that was okay. a pilot study, pilot. pre-phase one. Okay. And then we had to work with the FDA because this was a new form of treatment to get approval for a phase one study, which we began about three years ago and did 20 patients in whom we gave three treatments, each of them over a period of, uh, you know, every three months. Mm -hmm. And so um, they, and then followed them for a year afterwards. And we have just completed the phase one study. The last 20th patient got treated in September this year, 2016. And we are going to do the follow-up for that patient in December, and then hopefully we'll publish the results. So we've completed the phase one study. Are you able to give any um, information about what you've seen in terms of progress pre-publication? Yes, so the goal of the study was to have safety and tolerability established so that the patients did not have any bad outcomes, which we did not see any serious adverse effects in any of the 20 patients. Nobody needed to be hospitalized. Nobody was treated for meningitis. Nobody developed a brain tumor or anything else. So that was very good. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Secondly, we had the reasonable, the patients tolerated the medicine, the stem cell infusions pretty easily. They didn't really have too many acute, like, you know, nobody really didn't want to continue with the study. They were all okay with it. And we were looking for some improvement. And, and out of the 20 patients, 10 were in wheelchairs and 10 were having ambulatory difficulties using walkers and canes and so on. And out of the 20 patients, 15 out of the 20 patients we feel have improved in muscle strength. And eight out of the 20 have had a functional change of significance, which means the change in EDSS score and so on, which is a disability score. Yep. And if I could just explain that so people really understand Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You can be um, using a walker and notice that your left arm is stronger or your left leg is stronger, but you would still be using the walker. We have a disability scale that we use to measure, which is agreed upon so that all neurologists or other people who are looking at it for publication purposes can agree on a scale. So zero is a patient who has completely normal exam and 10 is somebody who died with MS because of MS. So Usually, for example, somebody who uses a cane has an EDSS score of about six. Somebody who's in a walker bilateral support for walking it has an EDSS score of 6.5 and, and so on. And then you measure the distance they walk and some other things. So we used patients who had EDSS scores of 3.5 to 8.5 in this in this uh, study. Which side note, how many studies are out there that are actually seeking patients with an eight EDS S scale? Like not? It's very unusual. Yes. yes. Very unusual, yeah. Okay. So, so we've finished the phase one and now we have presented all the data to the FDA and they have approved a protocol for us to do a phase two study. And uh, hopefully this, the goals of the phase two study will be different from phase one. We are looking now Obviously, we're still interested in safety, but we're now like trying to do a, a double blind control study where we can establish effectiveness of this treatment or efficacy. So this is exciting because this will be the first phase two study ever done in the United States using stem cells for reversibility of neurological function in MS. And um, when you talk about functional change, recognizing that everybody living with MS, each person is an individual case, what was the most drastic example of functional change that you saw out of those 20 patients? 
So before I publish this, I just don't want to get into that. I think it was pretty dramatic in one or two patients, but I don't want to okay. say that until we publish this because also I don't want to give false hopes to patients. And I think if it's published and they can review the data and they'll have a better, but it's, it's encouraging. It's encouraging in us enough for us to proceed with a phase two because it involves a lot of spending of money and getting research money. And we would not do that if it wasn't encouraging us that we are at least on the right path. Noted. In your phase two trial, how many patients will you have and what will be the criteria for them? So the FDA mandated the criteria because they wanted us to consider, unfortunately, they now want us to concentrate on patients who are all ambulatory. Hmm. So they're going to take people either using ambulating with a limp or something or using a cane or using a walker. And if they are wheelchair bound, they're going to be excluded from the phase two study, at least at this part, because they want to be able to measure the time that people use to walk and uh, make some objective criteria, which is easier to do with patients who are at least ambulating with a walker. So we're going to be restricted to some extent. We're going to use 50 patients and all of them are going to get treatment and all of them are going to get placebo because it's a crossover design. So year one, half the patients will get treatment, and year two, uh, the placebo patients in the first year will get the treatment in year two. Got it. It's a two-year study and one-year follow-up. And for you, having been in this industry of MS for over 20 years, what have you seen in the realm of progressive in terms of the way it's viewed and the way people are treating it? How has that um, advanced? Well, actually, that's a very good question. So all, a lot of the advances have been in the relapsing remitting. So now if you have newly diagnosed relapsing remitting MS, it's almost more than 90% certain that you can stop the disease and really be effectively treated provided you, you, listen, you, know, you have a good doctor and you work together with him and so on or her. Um, but with progressive disease, unfortunately, there are very few effective treatments. And this is not an effective treatment for progressive disease. This is a repair treatment. So we are hoping that as people transition from relapsing remitting to secondary progressive, we can do this treatment to, to kind of reverse them into the active phase and you know, be treated effectively so they don't get disabled. And also I think with primary progressive MS, because there is, maybe there is some drugs that may have slight efficacy uh, with uh, the B cell therapies now, but but um, I think we can introduce this stem cell treatment very early in their disease so they don't really become disabled, hopefully, if it works. That's the goal. Awesome. And um, for you as somebody who spends your time not only doing excellent research, but also being a clinician, what would you say has been the most valuable lesson that you have learned um, from your patients in terms of MS? Well, I think for... The relapsing remitting patients, for me, it has been the importance of hope and the importance of hope based on the reality of the possibilities that now exist. I think if you marry the two, I think that really gives you the best results. For progressive disease, I think it's the humility that I've had to develop at really initially my helplessness and then knowing how I felt when I saw these patients, that really moved this stem cell project and provided the impetus for developing a stem cell program. And until we are successful, I think we should continue to be uh, humble as physicians about how little we can do to these patients apart from just giving them physical therapy and so on. But these are beginning, I mean, I think I feel that we are all starting new therapies that they will be directed at progressive patients, and hopefully we can also give them realistic hope uh, based on, on these, these approaches. And one of the things that I can certainly say from my experience, having met a lot of people living with MS, is the whole idea of quality of life and what that means. Um, and one of a, a previous conversation I had with a clinician is, you know, one, when they start their journey of MS, feel that being in a wheelchair or losing mobility could be the absolute worst thing in the world. Um, and how for the people where that, that does kind of uh, open up, 
how it ends up not being the case and how there's a lot of kind of in between in terms of how you can still have a great life. Um, and that's one of the things I think is amazing in terms of the stuff you're doing of finding a way to actually repair damage that may still may keep somebody disabled, but improve in, in some realm. Yes. Yes, that's absolutely true. If you can improve patients' lives, that acts as a great impetus for them to keep trying harder and working. I think when, and that's part of the hope message which I was speaking about. But we really need to get the cure of this disease. And if we can find the cause, I think at all times, my sort of central driving force, and I hope the society would, would do this as well, is, is stop concentrating on things that our background noise and we need to get to find the cause of this disease so that we can actually work towards a cure and so really get this behind us so we don't even have to worry about repair eventually you know that right. would be the ultimate goal well one other thing i'd love to add which i think is awesome is in light of your center you're a place that actually really looks at ms from a holistic perspective so you may also really be hell bent on figuring out the cure but in light of living with MS, you also are open to things like looking at diet, right? Yes. Of, um, of having a more holistic perspective. And I think that's important. And that's kind of the way of the world that I've seen on how the MS is, you know, the world of MS is changing is being more open to thinking of a all around perspective of how to live. Yeah. So we, we have a naturopathic physicians, you know, board certified in naturopathic medicine. And I think we are probably the only center in the United States that actually has somebody on staff full time. And that's important because I think it's not just um, how it's mind over matter. It's how what you eat is what you are kind of thing. You know, you have to really focus on that, how active you are and having an exercise program that's tailored for your needs. I think having a good outlook, having your uh, be hopeful and combining that with the best we can offer in the western medicine i think you know the traditional therapeutics i think that's 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 that gives you the best results at least sure. in my experience they're not mutually exclusive no absolutely not that's awesome in fact they are probably the best form of how to treat a patient yeah that's awesome well it has been a pleasure meeting you almost in person yeah. and uh and i look forward to hearing what happens we will certainly keep everybody who is watching this and all of our viewers updated on your progress thank you so thank much dr sadiq for your time thank you for inviting me thank cheers you.